Good afternoon. I am Lynn Griesmer. I'm president of the Amherst Town Council. And so welcome to our fair town if you don't live here. And if you do, do live here, we're pleased to have you. Uh, we are so pleased today to have Commissioner Carlos Santiago with us, who is Commissioner of Higher Ed in Massachusetts, and our state senator, Joe Comerford, and our state rep, Mindy Dom, who have been so delightfully careful to make this arrangement for the voices of Western Mass to be heard and to hear from you, Commissioner. So thank you. And Paul, do you have anything else? OK, then we'll proceed. Good afternoon, everybody. I am so proud to represent the 3rd Hampshire District. Um, when we scheduled this, we were aware that it was the end of the summer and that's a difficult time for people to be around, much less to show up to an event like this. And so I'm just so proud and grateful that you took the time to come. I'm going to give some acknowledgments and also give a little bit of background about what we had in mind when we developed this and then hand it over to my partner in everything at the state legislature, my incredibly effective and um, uh, generous partner, State Senator Joe Comerford. <laughs> Please don't. Um, but first, I want to thank our staff, if you don't mind. Um, they're sitting over there. Please raise your hands. That's Katie O'Leary on the right. She's my legislative aide. And Elena Cohn on the left, Senator Comerford's district director. Let's give them a hand because they've really, they've taken care of all the details and made our wishes come true. Um, I also really want to welcome the commissioner. Thank you so much for being so gracious and generous to come to Amherst. Um, you agreed to do this, I think, in February when we first met to talk about imminent school closures and college closures. I don't know if you thought we'd really take you up on it, um, but I'm really grateful that you're here. And as you can see, our community is pretty engaged with this issue. Um, our thought today was that, um, as we all know, in Amherst, we've been, in the past six, seven months, um, we've been aware that there could be an imminent school closure and one that's very dear to our hearts. Um, and Senator Cumberford and I have been aware of it, but we've been monitoring it and tracking it. We've been working with the Department of Higher Education. We both sit on the Committee on Higher Ed. Senator Cumberford is the vice chair of that committee. And so we've been involved on it in many different ways, both in, as an advocate as well as a committee member and legislators. And um, as some of you know, the governor has produced legislation on this that we've heard in committee. And also the Board of Higher Ed and is trying to develop regulations as a way to implement that legislation. And so this convening is really an opportunity for you to hear from the commissioner what their thinking is and to open it up to your questions, your concerns, your thoughts, your input. Since we scheduled it, there was a public hearing scheduled on the board's regulations for Springfield for next week. And the commissioner has assured us that any input that's provided at today's meeting or conversation will be put into the hopper of what they're receiving as part of the public hearing so that your concerns and input will have an influence in terms of the, what the Board of Higher Ed will be doing. I want to let you know that so we'll be doing a lot with social media today. Um, we were concerned that nobody would show in the room because everybody would be away. We're thrilled you're here, but we were wrong, and I've never been happier to be wrong about something. Um, but for people who aren't in the area, we wanted to provide them with an opportunity to participate. And so Amherst Media is recording this live. As a result, we've been able to tap into their live video. And Elena and Katie are both tracking Facebook and Twitter for people who may be commenting and asking questions as they watch it online. And so we'll be hearing from you, and hopefully we'll be hearing from some folks um, online. Um, if you don't want your face on social media in a photo, um, you should let us know before you leave today. Um, I also, I forgot one more thank you, and that's to um, Amherst Media and to the town of Amherst for giving us the space, and Angela Mills in the back in the red shirt, who's been the town representative who's been working with our staff um, on the details. One more just piece, and that's when, we, um, when people come and speak, someone asked outside, how long will we have? That was a good question that we hadn't anticipated. Um, but in the State House, folks are offered three minutes to give a, um, a testimony, and so we thought three minutes would probably be an adequate amount of time. And without further ado, I think I've covered my points. I really, it's my pleasure to introduce to you not only a newly elected public official in the State House, but we could not have a better state senator than Joe Comerford. I am 
increasingly proud that she's my state senator, and I can only tell you that she is 100% partner for everything that's important to the 3rd Hampshire District. So, Senator Cole. Thank you so much. Hand for Representative Dahm. So now I get to gush a little bit about Mindy. Uh, so, and I want to put that in the context, and, and Rep Dom and I often do this. This region has come to expect significant collaboration between House members and Senate members. And in an area like Western Massachusetts, which is less represented in the State House just because of the density of our population, also two hours west, it's really important, actually, that we lock arms in initiatives. And we, you know, I like to say that we try to punch above our weight in the State House, and we can only do that through strong partnership. And uh, Mindy Dom is as fierce as she is gracious. Uh, and it's the two-pronged approach, I call it the Dom approach, uh, that gets so much done for the Third Hampshire. And so you are my partner in this and all, Rep Dom. Um, and please let me welcome, we have three college presidents with us today. Um, join me in welcoming President Eve Solomon Fernandez from the Greenfield Community College. Uh, <laughs> President Christina Royal from HCC, Holyoke Community College. And we have interim Hampshire President Ken Rosenthal. And congratulations to Hampshire on your new appointment. So as, as Rep Dom said, we met with you, Commissioner Santiago, uh, early in our tenure, and that was in large measure uh, really propelled by what was happening at Hampshire. Also our, our clear interest, because we both got to serve on higher ed, um, in higher education. And so again, I want to join Rep. Dom in thanking you, Commissioner. You've been in the State House to meet with the delegation at our request. Your team has been incredible. Uh, you've come to kick off the Public Higher Ed Caucus in the legislature, which both Rep. Dom and I serve on. Uh, so Rep. Commissioner Santiago has been clearly interested in engaging with the legislature and in also in engaging with community members. So thank you so much. I also, yes, yes, let's give a hand to Commissioner Santiago. Uh, so a little bit about the agenda today. We'll hear from Commissioner Santiago. Thank you to your team and all of uh, the work that went into uh, making a PowerPoint for us. And then Rep. Dom and I will facilitate real uh, communication between you and the, and the commissioner. So we'll invite folks to come up, make statements, ask questions, being mindful, as Rep. Dom said, and we'd be grateful for this, uh, that you hold your comments, if you're going to make comments, to three minutes so we can really hear from as many people as possible. Because in addition to the college presidents, I want to say, and we're very happy to say that we have robust representation from the other area colleges, and so leaders from those campuses as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to provide a, um, a brief introduction of uh, Dr. Santiago. He's a very modest man. Uh, so we'll, we'll consider this just a little window into his significant accomplishments. So uh, Carlos Santiago is Commissioner of Higher Ed for Massachusetts, appointed to this position by Governor Charlie Baker in July of 2015. Working with the Board of Higher Education, he is responsible for providing overall direction to public higher education in Massachusetts and helping shape state-level policies that maximize the benefits of higher education to the Commonwealth and its citizens. Commissioner Santiago joined the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education in April 2013 as the Senior Deputy Commissioner for Academic Affairs. His past academic appointments include that of Chancellor of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and that's uh, Wisconsin's second largest research university, he brings over 30 years of experience in public higher education. Commissioner Santiago also served as provost and chief operating officer at the University at Albany. That's a SUNY school. I'm a New Yorker, so really proud of SUNYs. He was a professor of economics at UWM and SUNY Albany and holds a PhD in economics from Cornell University. He is the author or co-author of six books. I don't know where he finds the time, and has published dozens of articles and book reviews, of which many focus on the economic development and the changing socioeconomic status of Latinos in the United States. On two separate occasions, in 1996 and in 2011, 
Commissioner Santiago has been named one of the 100 most influential Hispanics in the United States by Hispanic Business Magazine. Join me, please, in welcoming Commissioner Carlos Santiago. There we go. That should, should improve things. Thank you so much for coming out on a Friday. Beautiful weather. Uh, only two of us in the entire town are dressed in suits, in black suits, <laughs> top it off. Uh, Alex Nally will be our scribe today. Uh, he's a staff member in our legal affairs uh, department. And uh, Dina Papanicolaou is our legal counsel. Of another staff member, there she is, Katie uh, Abel, our Associate Commissioner for External Relations. I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to see such a, such a, a large crowd and to see old acquaintances, uh, not only the two presidents uh, from our public institutions, uh, my old friend Manuel Frau, where's Manuel? There he is. Manuel and I go way back to the early 90s where I was the head of a struggling professional organization uh, in uh, ethnic and area studies, uh, and uh, the organization um, had lost a lot of money with the previous president. So Manuel uh, said, why don't we do it in Amherst? We can use the residence halls, and uh, we'll save some money, and we'll turn the organization's finances around, and we did. So I'm very uh, proud of the, the work that, uh, that we accomplished together. There are others of you that uh, I know and, and have worked with, and I'm, I'm delighted to see all of you. And particularly, uh, I, I have to acknowledge your state representatives. Uh, Senator Comerford and Representative Dom have been on, they were on our doorstep <laughs> uh, when we began seeing uh, difficulties for a number of our institutions, and they uh, have been uh, uh, very open about concerns, and uh, they have uh, certainly helped us uh, uh, shape, I would say, our, our, our regs as we go forward. And we are using today as an opportunity to continue shaping that, uh, the, the regulatory process. Um, our, our legal counsel has been leading our efforts uh, in the department to draft those regs. They're now open for public uh, discussion, and Alex is here to take any uh, commentary that uh, he hears. He will make sure that uh, it uh, uh, goes to the appropriate folks. Um, so I have a, a brief PowerPoint, a uh, brief around 20 minutes. The, almost everybody t says that 20 minutes is the attention span that uh, you can keep an audience. And then I just want to open it up and feel free to ask me questions on this topic, the topic of uh, uh, closures and mergers and consolidations in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, you should know, a week and a half ago, I was in uh, the State Higher Education Executive Officers Association in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. We had our annual meeting. And in fact, uh, I talked about this with my colleague SHIOs, is what we're called, state uh, executive officers. And a lot of states are going through what we are going through, uh, Virginia, Ohio in particular. Uh, we are far ahead of any other state that we know of in terms of moving uh, 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 legislation forward and, and having these kinds of conversations. So uh, I, I dare say that, again, when it comes to education, a lot of states are looking in Massachusetts and how we're dealing with this particular situation. Um, we've actually been at this for a while. Uh, while everybody remembers uh, Mount Ida, which occurred in April of 2018, uh, the reality is we have been engaged in this work uh, and we have a uh, 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 responsibility to uh, both grant degree granting authority to an institution and also revoke degree granting authority uh, over institutions and to review the financial stability of institutions over, over time. And I'll distinguish a little between the public and private institutions. Uh, but by and large, the process has worked quite well. Uh, by and large, you haven't heard about a lot of these. You've heard of some of them. You may have heard of the, the merger between Wheelock and, and, and Boston University. Uh, but clearly, um, what we're seeing is that, uh, uh, that this is today a fact of life. We are seeing institutions, even today, just this morning, I opened up Inside Higher Ed, and there was a story of Bridgewater University. Uh, I think it's Bridge in, 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 in Connecticut. 
now has a, a acquired an institution in, I believe, in Vermont. Uh, we are seeing even, if you look at that list, one that might surprise you is Northern Vermont University. Why is the Department of High, Massachusetts Department of Higher Education involved in the closure of Northern Vermont? Well, Northern Vermont, their entire system was being restructured, uh, but they had an outpost in Lawrence. And uh, they decided to close that, and we had to be part of the, the closure process. So um, what's driving this? It's pretty clear it's demography. Uh, most of the institutions that have been impacted are institutions that are enrollment driven. Enrollments are down nationally, but particularly in the Northeast. We are seeing the biggest decline in enrollments in uh, over 30 years. Uh, if you look at the 2000, 2007, 2009 Great Recession, fertility rates dropped dramatically. And that means that this enrollment decline is going to be with us till about 2030, perhaps as far as 2035. So uh, this is what's causing pressure on the smaller enrollment-driven institutions um, that depend on tuition for their financial stability. This is a primary cause of, uh, of the, what, we're, what we're seeing and what we will continue to see. Now, our authority, we have authority over both the public and the privates, and I will talk more about the privates. Uh, uh, in Massachusetts, we differentiate between the institutions that were chartered before 1943 and those that were chartered after 1943. We refer to it as in the veterans, uh, uh, the GI Bill uh, came into being. There were a lot of institutions that sprung up in Massachusetts. Not all of them were really doing the kinds of jobs that the citizens expected, and the legislature decided to, in fact, create the Department of Higher Education to oversee the institutions of post-43 institutions. Um, we do disperse financial aid, uh, $120 million is dispersed to both public and private institutions. Of that $120 million, uh, a, more, a little more than, than a third, close to 37, 38% goes to private institutions as well. So we do uh, impact the private institutions in terms of financial aid. Now, up to now, we, our process works as follows, and this is, this is how it has worked uh, over those last six years and how we have dealt with uh, the institutions and, and what our conversations are like. Uh, basically, right now, if we find out that an institution is in financial difficulty, we will contact that institution. Now, the question is, how do you find out? Well, we don't, at, right now, we don't have any measures we don't uh, actually say, well, we think this institution is in trouble or that institution is in trouble. We wait for information to come to us. It's really not the most effective way. Uh, but we, uh, uh, we, sometimes it'll be reports from newspapers. Sometimes it'll be the institution itself, which is the way we prefer it. The institution itself contacts us and says, we're having financial difficulty. And we will start a conversation with that institution uh, and we will ask for financial information uh, and the institutions, by and large, welcome those conversations. By and large, they provide us the information. Uh, and they know that our responsibility is to close out or teach out those institutions should it close. And the numbers of institutions that have gotten in touch with us in the last few years has, has increased. Newberry College is why I put that down as one of the, the uh, it, it's not a, positive experience because it closed, but it was a positive uh, experience working with that institution in the sense that Newberry College's president contacted us. He said, we're in financial difficulty. Uh, can you help us with the closeout? We worked with them. We got other institutions to help take their students as need be. Uh, we had uh, 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 transfer agreements that were, that were put in place. It, was, it took a year and a half. People don't realize it takes that long took a year and a half, but it was an orderly closeout. Now, Newberry had a plan to succeed, and the plan was in part to sell off real estate, to sell off uh, real estate and, uh, and to, to merge with another institution. Those plans fell through. Uh, so Newberry did have to close, it was, uh, 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 but they did it in a way that was responsible, in a way that took into account the needs of the students, uh, and it's contrary to what happened with Mile Ida. Mount Ida, as, as uh, 
some of you might know, it came out in the newspaper, that I was at, at the state capital, at the, uh, the capital, and in fact, uh, was informed by a reporter that uh, Mount Ida had closed, and I couldn't believe it. We had no forewarning. There was no plan to teach out students. Students were left adrift. We had a, a meeting with parents, students, faculty, and staff, and it was a difficult meeting for everyone. It was difficult for them. It was very difficult for us as well to hear what they were saying. They were in, some of them were in majors that uh, one in the case of, uh, uh, was it funeral science, that fun funeral services, uh, there weren't places that they could transfer to. So it, it was quite traumatic, and subsequent research in other states, in fact, has showed that students that go through a process, a disorderly process of closure and teach out, are impacted negatively throughout their academic career. It's almost a, a, a traumatic experience for them. They leave places they know, people they, they, they're with, faculty they know, staff they know. It's a very, very difficult uh, um, uh, occurrence. So what we do is we begin an investigation when we are informed by others that an institution is in difficulty. We uh, decide, uh, based on the information we are given, whether that institution has uh, uh, prospects to get through the difficult financial times or not. And it's, it's a conversation that goes on weekly with the institutions. Uh, we we, we, we have, sit down with them and we, we share information. They provide us information. We, we um, review the information over time. Sometimes it's, an, it's a, uh, a plan to raise funds externally through philanthropy. And we monitor that and see how they're doing. At some point, though, there is always a difficult, a very difficult uh, decision that has to be made, which is at what point do you tell your students? At what point do you inform students? Mount Ida, unfortunately, not only did they not inform students, they were admitting a whole group of uh, new students. And in fact, their enrollment increased. And one would say, well, wouldn't that mean they were better off? Well, if you look at what they discounted their tuition, no wonder it increased. So they were giving all these very large financial aid packages to new incoming students, and their enrollment numbers were swelling. Not enough to pull them out of the difficult financial situation they were in. So uh, in the course of that conversation, we need to come to some degree of uh, agreement with the institutions to when can you notify students, knowing that that very decision is going to make it even more difficult for an institution to succeed. Um, after that, we continue to, to, to monitor uh, developments. Uh, we will assess the plans of the institutions, whether uh, they realistically think they can sell property uh, to, uh, to make up for the financial shortfall they might face. Whether it's a short-term or long-term problem is one thing we look at. I, I've talked to university presidents uh, in, in, uh, in Massachusetts, and some of them have told me, small institutions have basically said, look, we live paycheck to paycheck. We've been doing it for 20 years. We've survived. We go on. We, you know, we need funding at the end of the year, and it always comes in. And, and we have to be cognizant that there is no one set way to deal with this. The institutions are so different. One of the comments that I've made is that this is almost more art than science. We'll talk a little bit about the science of what we're trying to replicate. But in many, in many respects, if you treat the institutions as if they're all the same, you're going to be making mistakes. You have to look at the uniqueness of each institution. Um, <clears throat> so if a plan, <clears throat> uh, a plan from the institution is deemed uh, satisfactory and, and we feel confident that the institution will continue into the future well uh, and improve over time, that stops our, our engagement. Uh, otherwise, if right now, if the plan is found to be unsatisfactory and the decision is made, this institution is not going to uh, survive, um, or if the institution, we, we, we've encountered some situations where the institutions are reluctant to give us information when we think the, infer, the, the institution is in a difficult, uh, moving down a difficult road. And right now, the only tools that we have are uh, very blunt instruments. Uh, one is we revoke your degree granting authority. 
We call that the nuclear option. We have not used it. Uh, and the other is just as bad. We refer you to the Attorney General. You don't want to be referred to the Attorney General. Uh, so right now, our, uh, our uh, regs uh, allow for those two possibilities. Those are things we would obviously rather not use. Uh, and some of the, the new regs that we're uh, introducing have an alternative sanction. So this is what we're, we're in, attempting to do with the new regulations. One is we're expanding the scope of our oversight to all of the Massachusetts institutions. Um, not only the post-1943 institutions. Um, and we do it through financial aid. Financial aid is the one lever that we have, perhaps the only lever that we have, apart from um, uh, withdrawal of degree granting authority and submitting the institution to the Attorney General's uh, review. It's the financial aid. So we can use the financial aid lever to, um, to use it as a sanction if necessary. Uh, for an institution to provide us information. What we want is information, and we much prefer that that information be given uh, to us as we do our review uh, voluntarily from, from the institution. We want to move away from the reactive approach where we find out that something uh, is uh, not so good is happening to an institution. We want to be able to reach out to the institutions. And, and there's been a lot of discussion of what we're going to use. Uh, and there are a variety of metrics. There are a variety of measures. We've been working with ACOM. Uh, we've been working with the accreditor, uh, uh, the New England Council for Higher Education, uh, on, on measures as well. It's not all that easy to predict an institution that's having difficulty. Uh, and one of the measures that we've been discussing is a measure which, instead of attempting to predict whether an institution will succeed or not, it's a measure It kind of turns the question around. Uh, and it's, it's been criticized a bit, uh, but um, it does have, I think, conceptually some value because it focuses on students. And the measure is, does the institution have the resources to teach out its students? And the question is, does it have the resources to teach out four years of students, or two years, or a year and a half, or we've been looking at 18 months? And that's, that's a different kind of measure, because that's not what necessarily predicting whether an institution will fail or not. It's a measure of, of just saying, if we were to close today, does the university have the resources to teach out its students in an orderly way? And that could take quite a bit of, of time. Um, we want to clarify the, de the definition of financial stability uh, uh, for our institutions and, and, and be a, a bit more scientific, uh, use uh, certain metrics that uh, ACOM uh, and the ACOM institutions have been working with us and saying these are good metrics. Uh, we know the feds have metrics as well, uh, but uh, as, as we looked at some of the, the, the metrics, um, we looked at institutions that had failed over the last, was it, 10 years or so, and we found that the commonly used metrics found that those institutions would not fail. So they were not good uh, predictors, and we have started conversations with the federal government about improve, improving those measures as well. Um, right now, uh, we do not uh, uh, mandate a, uh, a notification to students. And we need to begin to come to agreement with the institutions to tell students, especially those students that, that the institution may be in difficulty and yet um, are applying to that institution. There has to be some word to these students to help prepare them for what might happen. And we need confidentiality. It's a crucial part of this process. Uh, as you know, uh, or you might not know, but I'm, I'm sure the uh, interim president knows, uh, that uh, we had, uh, we've been in conversations with Hampshire College uh, since we, we learned of, uh, of, uh, of the difficulties they were uh, encountering. And we, st we started a process of discussion, deliberation, exchange of information. And I have to 
credit the, the president and the institution. They were forthright, they provide, and I'm talking of multiple presidents, uh, they provided us the information we needed. We had very positive conversations. We learned of their plans and uh, we stood ready to help them in terms of a closure process if it were necessary. So we are still in that, in that process. But, um, uh, and I know there are some reporters here, we did get uh, uh, a request for all of the documents that we had exchanged with Hampshire College. Uh, and that was a concern, obviously, because we were in process of discussion. We had not completed uh, our review. And in fact, uh, the, um, uh, the Secretary of State supported our position, which is, there is what's called the deliberative process exemption for uh, freedom of information requests on documents till the process. While, while the process is ongoing, the documents are pretty much sealed. Uh, and uh, we think that's the only way that we can have these um, open conversations with the institutions. Uh, so in the governor's bill, there is language to include that as part of statute. Right now, we've been uh, we've been lucky that, that we have not had to provide the, those, those documents at this point, but we think that a statutory uh, uh, sort of um, uh, exemption would be, uh, would be important for us as we move forward. As you might imagine, uh, if, if confidentiality is breached, uh, it can imperil the entire uh, discussion process. Um, so, what are we... Um, what are we proposing? Uh, in, in the regs, we have annual screenings uh, where we uh, run a series of metrics and see if there are institutions that pop up in terms of institutions that may be in jeopardy based on a series of characteristics. And it's gonna look at a wide variety of, of, uh, of issues. For example, enrollment trends. It's not just, this is a snapshot of this year. It's going to look back and to see how an institution has successfully traversed uh, if they have uh, difficult times. Uh, we are going to ask for what we're calling risk mitigation plans, which is basically, how are you gonna correct the si situation? What are you doing? Uh, we're going to monitor the institutions. But one of the reasons why we wanted to do the screening is that, I mean, we have over, how many institutions in Massachusetts we oversee? Over 100. 121. 121. And we do not want to call 121 institutions and say, <clears throat> give us, all this financial information you might have to help us see how healthy your institution is. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, the vast majority of those 121 institutions are doing quite well, thank you. So what we wanna do is say, who is, what, what are the institutions that may be uh, in, in, in greatest jeopardy? And we wanna uh, focus on those, uh, on conversations with those institutions. Um, we want to uh, look at financial aid and see to the extent that financial aid can serve as a, an incentive for uh, institutions to provide us the information that we need moving forward as well. So, the teach out. That's again our responsibility. And there are a lot of components. This is not something you can do in two weeks time. A teach out plan takes literally months and months of discussion you have to find partners, and I do have to tell you, in Massachusetts, both public and private institutions, whether it's Mount Ida or Newberry College, have stepped up. They've stepped up. Uh, we, in, Newberry, in Mount Ida, we had college fairs on their campus with their students. We had admission staff. But it does take a lot of uh, coordination. Uh, because what we want to do, our objective, is to transfer any affected student to another institution so they can continue their major of study, they can complete their studies without loss of credit and without loss of uh, financial investment. That's our goal. And, and to tell you the truth, that is our primary concern. And any institution that helps us do that uh, is one that uh, will serve their students well. And by and large, the presidents of the institutions that have been impacted care deeply about their students. They do. Mount Ida may have been an exception, but the presidents care and their boards care uh, about what's the future of their students as well, and they will assist us in that, that process. We need to ensure that the communication to students, parents, community members, because this is not just an institution that closes down, 
Uh, these are institutions that are embedded in their community whose faculty, staff, and students engage with those communities. So community engagement is a huge part of this as well uh, and is something that you can't lose sight of. Um, and I, I, you know, people will ask me about our public institutions and I tell them the same thing. Uh, our public institutions, particularly the ones on the western part of the state, which we know that enrollment is a challenge for those institutions in the current en environment, but I have said over and over, I said, these institutions are fundamentally important to their communities. They're the economic drivers of their communities. I don't care what size they are. Uh, they not only support students, but faculty and staff. They are engines in those communities, and you can't lose sight of that as well. So that's very important. Uh, and we provide transitional support services for students as best we can. Uh, so this is the timeline. Uh, you are in at the point where our regs, our draft regs, are publicly being discussed. Uh, this is the time to comment. This is the time to, to engage in the conversation with us. Uh, we anticipate a vote by the Board of Higher Education on the revised regs. Um, uh, we haven't quite pick, picked a date. Uh, it's hard to get uh, calendars sometimes uh, when it's off cycle. Uh, but we would, our intent is to get the board to agree it uh, to the regs, to basically adopt the regs after the, the period of comment, uh, so that we have enough time to begin this work uh, with the new regs in December. Uh, and that means we need to start a lot earlier uh, and begin conversations with institutions that need uh, to be part of these conversations earlier. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, we can certainly open it up uh, on this or other topics. I'd be happy to, uh, to uh, address. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Poole. Thank you. And we'll figure out this. Thank you so much to Commissioner Santiago. That was undercut by the uh, malfunction here. Um, so thank you again. Uh, this is really uh, a pivot point here, friends. Uh, as the commissioner said, and I really want to thank you, commissioner, for acknowledging community mm -hmm. in the, the list of things uh, that concern us, that we have to care for and be mindful of. Uh, it's the reason that Rep. Dom and I wanted the commissioner to come to this community, to Western Massachusetts, uh, because we know that higher ed both public and private higher ed, uh, institutions are the heartbeat of this region. You know, you are the spine that connects us. Uh, you bring students in and educate students from our communities. Your staff and faculty live here. They drive our economies. I love that you use the word engine. Uh, these institutions, your institutions are the engine that make us work. You're our heartbeat. Uh, and so uh, Rep. Dom and I want to be your fierce advocates both here in the community and also in the State House and with uh, Commissioner Santiago and his team. So as the Commissioner said, these regulations are in process. This is where we get to hear from you about your thoughts about what Commissioner Santiago just shared, your questions, your, your hopes for next steps. Um, and so, and then Rep. Dom and I will listen intently and be with you in uh, community, in engagement, so that we can, again, be that kind of bridge for you with our colleague. And again, thank you to Commissioner Santiago for making this opportunity possible. So I know that there is a list of people. Okay. Somebody, yep. Thank you. Uh, there's a list of people who signed up to speak initially. Uh, so again, we're going to limit those comments to three minutes. Uh, comments or questions. The Commissioner will respond as you will, Mr. Commissioner and then we'll move on and get to the others in the room. Uh, so first we have Ken Rosenthal, interim president of Hampshire College. Would you like me to sit here or? Thank you. And I'll, and I'll try to speak fast. Uh, thank you, Senator Comerford, Representative Tom, Commissioner, 
Thank you very much for coming today to talk with us about the challenges that so many colleges face. I'm Ken Rosenthal, interim president of Hampshire College, and I know something about these challenges. I also have some familiarity with planning for the future of higher education. I have been involved with Hampshire College since 1966, before it even opened its doors to students. I want to begin with this. Hampshire has chosen Ed Wingenbach to be its next president. He will come from Whitman College next month to begin what I confidently believe will be a long and successful tenure. When you meet him, I'm sure you will join those who know him in believing that Hampshire's trajectory is positive. It will be a college that will be smaller for a year or two, but we're regrowing, we're confident we'll serve our students well, we're relaunching our admissions office, and we'll be celebrating our 50th anniversary in the autumn of 2020, and we hope you will join us then. From its beginning, Hampshire actively reflected on our work as an experimenting college and shared our findings for the benefit of higher education broadly, and we join you now in hoping to better understand the world of higher education in general and the kinds of concerns that affect Hampshire College in particular. Some of the metrics needed in evaluating a college's prospects are easy to find, and I hope to discuss them with you and your staff, but in the few minutes I have with you today, I want to mention some of the less tangible aspects of a college that you and the public you serve should know, and my example, of course, is Hampshire College. A college is not just bricks and books and financial balance sheets. It's also the sum of the influence it has on those who pass through it as students, the influence they have improving the communities and the businesses and the world they inhabit, the contributions of its faculty and staff to the advancement of knowledge and of understanding and the impact the institution has on the community that surrounds it. And um, we are a small and young college, but I submit that its influence and contributions in the areas I've mentioned are truly remarkable. Its student-centered mode of critical inquiry that is central to its pedagogy, its written evaluations that replace grades and class rankings, its break from the lockstep of four-year march to a degree, and its recognition that faculty can teach best while learning with their students. These are things that many places do. Hampshire does all of them. And the accomplishments of our alumni validate Hampshire's teaching style. Entrepreneurial approach, not just in business, but in science, in medicine, in government, and life in general, as award-winning filmmakers, writers, and artists, cabinet secretaries, ambassadors, and town managers, scientists, scholars, and professors. And these alumni are still young. The oldest are about 67 years old, and the youngest, and more than half of them, are not yet 42. It's a place of academic rigor. National Science Foundation says Hampshire is among the top 3% of colleges whose students go on to earn PhDs. A surprising number of alumni contribute to the economy and culture of the Pioneer Valley, and some assert that the revival of Northampton in the last decades is due in no small degree to the Hampshire alums who have moved there. And the college itself is a major player in this economy. I want you, too, to consider Hampshire's partnerships not only five colleges incorporated, but also the cultural village on Hampshire's campus, the home of the internationally known Yiddish Book Center, founded by a Hampshire alum and credited with nothing less than saving and preserving the Yiddish language for posterity, the Hitchcock Center for the Environment, the Eric Carl Museum, his extraordinary collection and exhibits offer picture book art and stories to children. That's part of the partnership that it has, but especially also the newest, the R.W. Kern Center, built by the construction company of a Hampshire alum, which makes Hampshire the only place in the world with the Hitchcock Center with two net zero living buildings on its land. These were buildings that were constructed at the highest environmental standards and operated no environmental costs. And we have an agreement with the International Living Future Institute that provides offices for them in the Kern Center so together we can educate the world about environmentally responsible building design, the way all future buildings must be built. Financial viability is, of course, another measure of value that is important, but accountants know that financial balance sheets often underrate the values of non-financial assets that they record, and so it is at Hampshire. Our 800 plus acres, the college occupies more than a square mile, will be worth far more when developed than the book value they carry, and in due time, for its benefit, Hampshire will develop some of this acreage. Some of it is forever to be preserved as part of our contribution to the Commonwealth's efforts to preserve the entire north face of the Holyoke Range, but some of the land is commercially zoned and some could be developed for housing in cooperation with the college. And these are hidden values and appear nowhere on the balance sheet. And finally, there is the value that is unlocked by circumstances such as the one Hampshire faced this year. As friends and alumni came forward to support the college in unprecedented ways in the last four months, 
National and local media have paid attention, showing that Hampshire is a place of consequence in the world of higher education. And because of this intention, I want to add, the last word that I want to add is a word of caution. And you mentioned this, sir. It is something akin to the uncertainty principle in physics that the very attention paid to a subject affects it. If you give more credence to current difficulties and less to future possibilities, you may overemphasize the risk, and that by itself can exacerbate the problems. No institution can predict the future with certainty, and I caution you and all of us not to want to be so protective that we overemphasize the risks and thus make your own view of negative possibilities self-fulfilling. Thank you very much for your attention, and thank you very much for talking with us today. We're very glad you're here. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. President. Commissioner, would you like to respond? Well, um, certainly um, the last statement that you, uh, that you made was, is very appropriate. I did say this is uh, more of an art than a science. Um, but I don't think in the current environment uh, we can simply, especially for uh, if our role is to protect students, just let things happen. And, and, and I think as, in our, as we've had conversations both with Hampshire College, I mean, Hampshire College provided us information uh, before we asked for it. Uh, and I, I think that is, is a key. And I think as, as the institutions, and, and, and I have not really talked a lot about the role of the accreditor, um, but I will be um, uh, quite honest. Uh, when I saw the information on Mount Ida, that uh, had not been provided to us, uh, but after the fact, I looked at this information that uh, appeared uh, six to eight months earlier, and I said, oh my God, I'm not sure this institution is gonna survive. And I think had that information been available, we could have intervened perhaps earlier and at least made attempts to get students uh, effectively transferred on a timely basis. So uh, we were, I'll be honest, we were quite surprised when we learned of, of Hampshire's difficulties. Uh, it was not an institution, if I can say this, I've got my legal counsel there, so she'll tell me whether I've uh, gone too far, but it was not an institution that was anywhere on our radar screen. And I think that's a, uh, a sense of, gives you a sense of the, that this is less of a, a science than, a, uh, than art. Uh, and I do agree that an institution's uh, uh, assets are more than some of the physical assets, as the president was, was mentioning. How you balance these things out is not all that easy. Uh, but I think since then, we have, we have effectively had conversations with institutions to, to ensure that it is an orderly transition, if that transition is necessary. Thank you so much, and I'm sure we'll get into greater depth. Yep. And I know that Representative Dom and I are interested in the balance between how we care for students and how we support institutions in the state. You know, what we can and must do to support institutions that are struggling in uncertain times. And I know you care about that too. Uh, next up, uh, we have Ed Bourgeois, who's here. Again, Mr. Bourgeois, I just ask that you keep your comments to three minutes and then if the commissioner wants, he'll respond and we'll continue down the road. Just found out about this this morning. Um, sort of a related situation. Um, I work in agriculture, and I'm concerned about our land-grant mission at our state university, which is also a closing of, like, the Waltham uh, uh, facility recently, where the administration, I guess, will be moving to Mount Ida, but we will be losing the farmland that we use for experimentation um, with climate change, agriculture, food, environmental issues. It's a time when the public really needs access to our land grant and the land grant mission um, to keep these facilities and keep aware of the importance of the public being students, teachers, researchers, and being able to collaborate with our public institutions as they were originally attended. And I'll just keep it simple to that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's important to note Massachusetts is one of the most decentralized systems of public higher education. Uh, uh, I've worked in two others in Wisconsin and in New York, part of the SUNY system. These are command and control systems. 
These are systems where a president of a system or a chancellor of a system makes decisions and they reverberate down. I'm not saying that is the best way to, to, uh, to, uh, to structure a system. Massachusetts is probably uh, farthest on the extreme in the sense that it is very decentralized. Every campus has their own board. Uh, we have an overarching uh, board of higher education. So the decisions that you, that you mentioned um, uh, are decisions that are done at the campus level, the board. Uh, we were involved with uh, Mount Ida in terms of we had to approve the, uh, whether it was or not going to be a satellite campus or branch campus. Uh, that was the extent of our authority in that particular uh, transaction. So there are limitations to what authority we have. Uh, we try to make sure, and in fact there, there's, and I have two presidents here uh, who can uh, hopefully attest to the fact that this decentralized model can work well uh, if you can get the campuses, the institutions to agree, if you can convince them, because one is if you could bribe them to do certain things, but we don't have a lot of resources in public higher education in Massachusetts. So you have to convince the institutions that what we're trying to do is gonna benefit their students, their faculty, and, and their staff, and their, the institution as a whole. And I'm, I'm proud to say that we have a group of presidents that uh, have uh, been very supportive of, of the initiatives that we have been moving forward. Uh, we have launched a major initiative in the area of equity uh, in our public institutions, and that's gonna be front and center. Our board has uh, approved it as well. Thank you. Uh, next up, please, Kevin McCaffrey from Mount Holyoke. Thank you very much. Thank you to the commissioner for your excellent presentation. Also, thank you to uh, our local representatives for putting uh, together this uh, great program uh, or, uh, on a very important issue. Uh, I have a statement that I'd like to put in the record, and if I could, I'd, I'll, uh, I'll read part of it and, and, and uh, summarize the rest up to three uh, minutes worth. First of all, it's a, it really indicative of how important higher education is to the Valley that on the most beautiful afternoon of the year, we have so many people in this room. Uh, certainly protecting students, families, and communities in the Commonwealth from unexpected school closings is a very important issue. Uh, not only are students from traditionally marginalized populations disproportionately affected by closings, as shown in a recent report by ACE, uh, the American uh, Council on Education, but many communities depend on a higher education for jobs for purchases of local goods and services, and for a host of other benefits. Working together to protect our students, our employees, and the communities where we live and work is very important regarding the proposed regulations. Mount Holyoke joins with ACOM institutions uh, and others in supporting the approach now being developed that brings about strong collaboration between the New England Commission on Higher Education and the Department of Higher Education. Uh, that collaboration will ensure effectiveness, efficiency, and fairness and will protect the interests of our students, our communities, and the Commonwealth. Underpinning this conversation, of course, is just how important higher education is to the Commonwealth. Uh, our institutions are the envy of the entire world. People come from around the world uh, to go to school in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, but not only that, uh, so many students in our schools uh, in Massachusetts are from the Commonwealth. At Mount Holyoke, for example, 19% of our students come from Massachusetts. 6% come from Hamden, Franklin, and Hampshire counties. We're very proud of that fact. So we're working very hard to educate students from Massachusetts. And there's no doubt, too, that higher education is essential to the state's economic health. Uh, certainly, the Pioneer Valley draws tremendous uh, benefits from the five colleges, from the Springfield Colleges, from Greenfield Community College, uh, uh, HCC, and other institutions that are lucky enough to be in the best part of Massachusetts. <laughs> Statewide private institutions, according to ACOM, uh, generate $36 billion a year in terms of economic activity for the Commonwealth. Uh, challenges faced recently at Hampshire College, and it was uh, great to hear the, uh, uh, the interim president speak to these issues. Challenges which I am sure will be met and overcome emphasize how important it, it is that we all work together colleges, elected officials, business leaders, citizens, not only to protect the health of higher education, but to maximize the economic benefit of the sector to the Valley and to the Commonwealth. Again, thank you to you, uh, Commissioner, to Secretary Pizer,
for everyone working on this issue. It's very important, and whatever we can do to help, we're happy to do. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. I think we'll move on to another okay. comment. Good. Uh, and remember, uh, thanks to the commissioner and his team, everything, uh, as uh, Kevin just said, everything is being read into the public record. So it will be part of the due diligence around what's happening at the state level. Uh, welcome to Laura Wank. Is Laura here? Okay. And also welcome to Rep Sabadosa, who joined us. Hi, thank you for being here and for listening to all of us. Um, much of what I wanted to say, of course, has been said, and I know Rep. Dom and Senator Comerford has talked a lot about the need for supports for the impacts on communities, not just uh, impacts on students. And although I'm a Hampshire College faculty member, um, and I'll, I care deeply about the integrity of an institution and taking care of students, um, but I also care about the staff and faculty that I've worked with for many years, and it's been heart-wrenching to see people leave. Um, it's difficult to stay, um, even watch uh, with all that's happened. Um, and I care about the community. I care about the pizza place up the street that depends on our students. Um, and I worry about housing values in town. I mean, the repercussions, obviously, are huge. But the other things I wanted to say are that um, the diversity of colleges that we have matters greatly to the health of the Commonwealth and to the social justice. When I was a high school teacher and when I talked to the friends of my daughter and uh, the children of my friends, I'm always telling them, students who feel they wouldn't get into an R1 university, that there's a college for everyone. And uh, that has to remain true or the uh, health of the whole region will suffer. And so what I urge is that in addition to the, to the regulations being put in place, that we also think about the supports. So the regulations may, make sense to me that we have to be thinking about the financial health of an institution and we have to think about transparency with students and families. But, um, but I wonder also as the costs of running a college increase, what is it that can be done about that? Um, the, you know, my partner would be the first to say, if you want to talk finances, talk to someone besides me, but, um, <laughs> but I do wonder about, you know, large, uh, chunk of our cost is, uh, to ben paying benefits, the healthcare costs of employees, um, the insurance, liability insurances for campus. and. It seems to me that those might be leverage points in the state. If we had Medicaid for all, what would happen to the cost of running a college? Um, and, um, and then also, what are the ways that a state can be involved in supporting negotiations between institutions? Um, the merger between Marlboro and Bridgeport seems so different than many of the others that I've seen in that Marlboro is able to maintain its autonomy and its programming yeah. with the idea of that it benefits Bridgeport students as well. So those are the kinds of things that I, I don't know what, what the conversations are at the state level, but those are the things I would wonder about and also would urge you to consider. Sure, thank, thank you. you. Those, are, those are great comments. And, and I, I think, um, Having the institutions, both public and private segments of our higher education system, engage in these conversations together is hugely important. When Mount Ida closed and, and we had the funeral services uh, program that was discontinued, um, we m helped facilitate uh, the exchange of equipment from Mount Ida to an institution, in this case Cape Cod Community College, who raised its hand and said, we'll do that program. And they didn't have the space. So Bridgewater State provided the space where the equipment from Mount Ida went in for the programs that we expedited approval for Cape Cod Community College. And that's an, an example of a public institution, but the private institutions were doing similar sorts of things. So I think when you have those conversations, when there is a collective will to, and, and not only that, Cape Cod hired the Mount Ida faculty that were in that program. It's really important uh, because that uh, you lose if you lose that talent, there is no program. We had an accreditor in that particular area that basically said, "You've got to 
virtually replicate what Mount Ida had. That was an accredited program to continue accreditation. So those are the things that we certainly can help with. Another area that, that I would highlight is financial aid. I talked about $120 million in financial aid that the Commonwealth provides its students at both public and private institutions. We need more financial aid for our students. Uh, in terms of uh, sort of at the national landscape, the amount of financial aid that Massachusetts provides its students for its public and private institutions is relatively limited compared to other states. We probably rank in the middle, 24th or 25th, uh, which is not what, when I tell that to folks, they don't, they are surprised. Uh, Tennessee, uh, Kentucky, Kentucky, with a population that is a bit less than us, so it's not all that much different, uh, provides $300 million worth of financial aid. Um, so there are mechanisms to support students and to support the institutions as well, and I think we need to continue to push those, uh, those particular uh, levers in as, as, as well. And the legislature has, you know, has been supportive of that. We had last year the biggest increase in financial aid uh, in Massachusetts in over 20 years. It was $7 million. Now, it came upon my decision to how those $7 million were going to be allocated, and as my community college presidents know, we put it into the community colleges. Uh, we expect, uh, you know, if as it grows, as the financial aid bucket grows, uh, the institutions and the students obviously will, will benefit. So there are different things that we can do uh, to, to support the, the, the institutions as well. Thank you so much, and I really appreciate your strong advocacy. I know Rep. Dom does too for more higher ed funding. Uh, actually, in the last two decades, Massachusetts has lost 32% per student in higher education funding from the legislature. We are accountable for that, and we are urging our colleagues uh, to increase the investment. Um, also, cheers for Laura for opening up the intersectionality of this conversation, right, with the call for robust health care reform and Medicare for all, right? Nothing happens in a vacuum. We all know that. And I think part of what Rep. Dom and I are doing on higher ed is connecting the dots. So when we do health care reform or when we do any other kind of infrastructure work, we can and should be thinking about the impact on higher education uh, and how we can support each other in sectors. Um, now we have uh, Town Council President Lynn Griesmeer and Town Administrator Paul Bockelman. So we're going to do a duo. Um, first of all, I lived on two sides of this issue with the University of Massachusetts as executive director of the Donahue Institute, working in higher ed for well over 40 years. Um, and now I'm president of our town council. And so as we approached the potential downsizing and or actually the real downsizing of Hampshire College and the potential of rumors of closure, uh, we had to all of a sudden look at this from another standpoint, not just the higher ed richness of Amherst, where we have three institutions, at UMass Amherst, Hampshire College, Amherst College. But my colleagues, two of whom are here, Andy Steinberg and Dorothy Pam from the council, we started having to look at issues like, oh, well, what does this mean for people being laid off, for people who no longer have their health care? What does it mean for the fact that our police force is now covering Hampshire College because they have either reduced or completely eliminated their police force? What, ha what does it happen? How does it affect the institutions immediately on its campus as well as places that are immediately next to it like Atkins Market or some of our bookstores? And so I urge you as commissioner working in a much larger organization under our good governor, to be working with the secretaries of Econ housing and economic affairs and others, so that as we look at these kinds of issues of college closures or mergers, we look at what the impact is on the towns, on the communities. And keep in mind, if you start closing one institution in the town of Amherst, that's a big bite. It may not be as big a bite for Boston but it's a big bite for Amherst. And so I, you have to look at communities differently as we look at this potential um, issue. Higher education is the fifth largest industry in Massachusetts. 
you're an economist. You know how important it is for all of us. And we all want to work very hard to keep it that way. But we also need to worry about the 351 cities and towns that are affected by what might be happening here. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Let me respond. Uh, just make a uh, quick response. Well, uh, you know, um, the department and the commissioner has more oversight over our public institutions than the privates. Uh, um, that's pretty clear. Um, but one of the thing I've and one of the things I've told our public institutions and the public presidents, the, the presidents of those public institutions is that in the current environment, if we are competing for that last student, our institutions, our public institutions are going to be in real financial difficulty. So I've really um, pursued an approach of collaboration uh, and our state universities and community colleges, I think, are working very, very closely together. And let me give you one example of something that I thought would never, I would never see in higher education. Uh, we've done surveys, uh, and we know that particularly in our community college system, we have food insecurity and homelessness. And we have begun to measure it, and we know it's extensive, and it's a problem. It's a serious problem. I don't know how a student that doesn't have a place to sleep can study with that, uh, or doesn't have enough food can study. That's the reality of many of the students that are, are in this community and in others as well. So one of the things we have done is we've worked with the Department of, of uh, uh, Katie, is Health and Human Services, and we have uh, created Five programs, six, the, the, the housing pilots. Four pilots, eight, two weeks, and Okay. Given that there are beds available in our state universities, we have been putting community college students that are homeless temporarily in those facilities. And we've been piecing together funding for it. There is no big, huge bolus of resources to do this, but we've been able to get from different departments. So I, I, the, the message that I give in response to what you, you, you said, which is hugely important, is we have to begin resolving some of these issues on a collaborative basis. And if we are of the mindset that this, these are the public institutions, these are the privates, never the two segments shall meet, I think we have got to start thinking uh, a little differently about how we interact. Uh, we all compete for students, but I think to the extent that we s compete over collaboration, uh, none of us are really going to move the needle. So uh, that would be my response to you. Here, here. Yeah. Thank you for being here, Commissioner. I'm Paul Bachman, I'm the town manager for Amherst. And Hampshire College is vital to our town's identity. It's vital to my identity because I'm a graduate of it. So full disclosure on that. Um, just a couple comments on your uh, regs. First off, I worry that your death watch list is going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. When you publish the, no the names of colleges and universities that are, in, that are struggling, that that just becomes a, a downward spiral and <coughs> there's, it creates a, a larger gap between the haves, say Amherst College with a $2.4 billion uh, endowment to a, the have-nots, which is a Hampshire College with a $57 million but endowment. So I worry about that in terms of your public disclosure piece of this. And I worry a little bit about that the orientation is more towards um, teaching out and helping, helping, or, helping mm -hmm. colleges to close versus helping them to, to thrive. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, and I also worry that your regulations team, uh, they, they focus a lot on teach out, but then they end there. They don't take into account the longer term implications for a community like Amherst, where Hampshire, as you noted, owns 600 acres in, in Amherst, 200 acres in Hadley. And um, so there are a lot of things that happen in, in Amherst if, if Hampshire were to close. And Lynn mentioned a number of them, uh, police force and things like that. But also, there's some things you would never think of, like our water system depends on Hampshire's uh, usage and the quantity of water they use for us to maintain the flow to the south end of Amherst. If Hampshire College weren't there, we would have to have pump stations or something to, to make sure the water flows through the system. Um, the Pioneer Valley Transit Authority has a stop toward in South Amherst primarily because of Hampshire College. If that were to close, would that, would that bus stop, would that bus line be terminated? Um, 
so, and then there's revenue impacts because of water and sewer revenue that we would lose, things like that. Most importantly, Lynn mentioned that you know, 70 employees have been laid off at Hampshire College, and those are families who live in the town of Amherst um, and have children here and go to our schools, and our schools are, need to be aware of, of that so they can keep an eye out for the children, because when your parent loses a job, it's traumatic for the family. But the single most important thing for me as a town manager concerns uh, land. So the three institutions of higher education in uh, Amherst are also the three largest employers and the three largest landowners. They don't pay taxes on that, which we all know. Um, <laughs> Hampshire College with 600 acres is land rich, even if it is cash poor. And that's what, where we worry, because it would be expected that the college would seek to liquidate its most valuable asset to meet its financial needs. There are few, if any, zoning restrictions on that land. Currently, the zoning bylaw regulates much of the institution's property without regard to use or form. There are no established dimensional standards for the majority of these properties, thus leaving bulk, mass, height, et cetera, up to the imagination of the developer. Were this land to become mon monetized and sold to a developer, the town would want to have a say over what was to happen through traditional land use permitting procedures, such as site plan review or special permitting, to ensure that any potential use of the property is consistent with the town's objectives for development and goals of our master planning. So in fact, um, I would also argue that a college or university that has been benefited, has benefited from not paying taxes on their vast land holdings, which puts, puts even more pressure on the average taxpayer in town, I believe that there should be a right of first refusal that the town would have that would allow the town to buy the land that has been sitting tax-free before it goes to a developer. So the town continues to express its hope and uh, has worked very, very well with the leadership of Hampshire College because we want Hampshire College to thrive. We want it to uh, be part of our three college town because that's a unique part of our identity. And I'd ask you in your regulations to look beyond the teach out piece to look at the impacts on the community because these institutions, especially on small towns, like Lynn said, um, have a, a disproportionate impact on the, on the smaller towns because 600 undeveloped acres in this town would be a gigantic impact on everybody's living in, uh, who are living here. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Commissioner, did you want to respond? Uh, yeah, I, you know, um, I want to be uh, honest about what we can and cannot do as, as, a, as a government agency, what authority we have, what authority we don't have. Uh, and I, I appreciate your, your, your comments, but I don't want you thinking that we, as, as a government agency with limited resources can stop a college from going under. I mean, we don't, we, I mean, we can help the students, we can help the communities in the transition, but we don't have either the resource or the authority to stop that, that process. We can certainly give our advice on uh, uh, any particular plan that, that may arise, and we do that uh, often. Um, I, you know, I, w I wish we could stop the process. Uh, we would have done it for the 18 institutions that have already been, been impacted. So we have to be realistic about what we can do and what we can't do. Um, certainly, I think getting the word out so that um, sister institutions work together, uh, you've got a good record of that here. I think that's important. Helping uh, if there are potential merger partners, brokering conversations. I think that's something else that we can, can certainly uh, engage in and well. So I'm not saying we don't have uh, any uh, ability to impact these uh, situations, and there is no death list. <laughs> there is no list uh, that, uh, that that basically uh, shows that in the inevitability of an institution closing. Uh, there is always hope. Uh, we try to um, to make sure that the conversations with the institutions are straightforward. Uh, we try to provide advice as much as we can, um, and you know. You had, someone had mentioned the, the higher ed in Massachusetts is the fifth largest industry. Actually, I use third or fourth. <laughs> uh, it's huge for Massachusetts. Uh, and and uh, uh, the rest of the states are looking at how we're dealing with this. 
Um, and I wish I could tell you this is a, a blip on the radar screen. And um, there was a colleague I met here who was a demographer or who had talked about demography. Um, this is going to last for at least uh, you know, another 10, perhaps even 15 years. And we've got to begin adjusting to that reality and ensuring that we can uh, persevere and, and have Hampshire College go through a very difficult period uh, and come out on the other end perhaps smaller but stronger as, as well. I think, and anything we can do to do that, uh, I think we will uh, certainly do. Um, if we had the resources to assist, we would do that. We can do it in some, with some of our buckets like financial aid, uh, but um, it's, it's, I, I don't want people thinking, oh, you're, you know, we, can, we can really salvage uh, every difficult situation that an institution uh, finds itself in. We've not been able to do it in the last six years. We've been able to assist, but we've not been able to do it. And the last thing we want to do is precipitate closure. The last thing we want to do is push an institution that's on the bubble uh, um, in, into, in a worse situation. And that's really, um, uh, in many respects, that's my responsibility uh, to, to ensure that we look at this uh, in creative ways. No, we're not going to have a sort of a single, uh, you know, metric that's going to determine who's going to survive and who's not, because that doesn't exist at this point. So uh, I understand what you're saying. I know the, the, uh, the importance and the value of these institutions to their, their community, and to the extent that we can help you, we will. But I don't want to give a false hope that we can fundamentally uh, change the, the, the reality uh, that, that we face. Uh, increase in birth rates would help. Uh, immigration, immigration uh, would help. Uh, and uh, it, you know, it, it's not only Massachusetts. It's not only Massachusetts. Look at New England. Look at Maine. Maine's had to restructure its entire public system. Look at Connecticut. Connecticut had to take all of its community colleges and create one. How many institutions were that? I think twelve or. Yeah, 12 institutions. We are seeing this happening around us. Uh, I think we have tried to address it in um, a, a, a concerted way to ensure that the, the least damage can impact our, our society. Thank you. Thank you so much. And on funding, that really is the job of the legislature, to open up more sources of revenue for higher ed. Um, now we're at the end of uh, the pre-sign up list, so I'll take hands for who would like to speak. President Solomon Fernandez, please. First of all, I want to say thank you to our delegation. Thank you for working so hard. We really appreciate all of your work, all of your efforts and your advocacy, and thank you, Commissioner, for being here. I really didn't intend to speak today. I was just going to sit and watch and listen, but I just want, when you made your comments, Commissioner, I think it spoke to me about how we need to work together. The world is changing. And if you've not read Nathan Graw's demography book, you need to read it. And for me, as a college president, I see us as needing to think differently because a new world order calls for more collaboration. And it's not just about surviving the next 10 plus years. It's not just about surviving until 2035. It really is about us working together much more collaboratively. <laughs> GCC sees itself as being, in terms of our curricular, in terms of our faculty, has been very much like Hampshire College. We are very much about putting students in the driver's seat of their education. We're very much about uh, cultivating uh, students and citizens for meaningful careers and also for local and global citizenship. I am extending publicly this invitation to partner with you um, because I am a member of this community. I live here. My children live here. And I would like to see our babies and our grandbabies being born here. And um, it really is, uh, it is in our selfish best interest to see that Hampshire thrives and we would very much like to partner with you. So let's think very differently. Let's be disruptive and let's do it in service of our students and our community. I love the call to be disruptive. Um, thank you, President Solomon Fernandez. Uh, we'll take another comment or question, please. Thank you. 
try not to put anyone at my back. My name is Joanna Brown, and I have a couple of uh, comments to make about Hampshire College, having transferred into the first class, also having served as Director of Alumni Relations and Fundraising at Hampshire from 91 to 97. I think that a part of the early story of Hampshire that deserves to be told is the fact that it was not a Hampshire person, but an Amherst College person, Harold Johnson, who gave the first major gift. That gift was then matched by the Ford Foundation. And I think that going forward for Hampshire, this is one maybe um, underestimated facet. There are many people who believe in Hampshire's purpose and who have contributed along the line. I think that now Hampshire has a new president and will be creating a new plan that the reach for potential support can be very broad. Perhaps one uh, road not taken in Hampshire's past was that it didn't fully understand the role of alumni support. And in fact, the whole development office, in my mind, was under-resourced. Under now, with a new plan being formed going forward, I think that could be changed. Um, the development offices at Amherst and Smith and also Mount Holyoke show what can happen when development resources are in place. And I think that's one critical juncture here. Uh, the other thing is to realize that um, it's been said the oldest alums are 68, uh, 67, I'm 68, I'm right with them. And in my seven years of going around the country for Hampshire, I spoke with many alumni, I spoke with alumni parents. And in general, the alumni parents said this, it's no longer my charge to support Hampshire, it's my son or daughter. There are still many parents of the earliest Hampshire alumni who are still living, and they're in their 80s and 90s. We have not yet seen the transfer of wealth from one generation to the next. So Hampshire's goal, in my mind, is to continue to be the vital, innovating, institution it has always been. I'm deeply grateful to it. And to look with a 30-year time frame, because within 30 years, that transfer of wealth will take place. Within 30 years, the alumni who are in their 30s and 40s now will take their place in all the different careers they do. Aaron Lansky invented the whole field of Yiddish studies. A small group of students at Hampshire collaborated and produced the first course on the Holocaust studies to be offered in any college or university in the US. The first Department of Cognitive Science was invented at Hampshire College. The ripple effect has already been tremendous. There's much more to do. And I'm very optimistic and hopeful, frankly. And I'm grateful to Ken Rosenthal. Thank you. Other comments or questions for the commissioner? Please. I'm Heather Hornick. I live here in Amherst. And I have a question about the authority of the Higher Ed Commission as you try to develop new regulations. Do you make any distinction between for-profit uh, and not-for-profit public institutions? Because I noticed on the list that there were some of each. And it made me wonder whether there are constraints that result from having to write regulations that are broad enough for such a variety of institutions. The, um, the, the for-profit and non-for-profit are guided under 610 CMR? Oh, sorry. Um, the, the, the regulations that oversee our for-profit and non-profit uh, are the same regulations that we have to oversee the public institutions are, are different. I don't know if you wanted to make a comment on that. Uh, yeah. There's one distinction. We do have heightened reporting requirements for the for-profit industry. but with re So there is a, a little bit of a difference, even though they're under the same set of regulations. Um, these new regulations that we're drafting with regard to um, assessing the financial 
challenges of institutions applies equally to for-profit and non-profit institutions. Did that answer your, your question? Yes. Hello, uh, I'm Leo Huang from uh, Greenfield Community College, where I'm the Dean of Humanities, Engineering, Math, and Science. Um, and uh, first, I want to support the BHE support with, with uh, um, K through 12, with, with their early college initiatives. But I'm wondering how much the BHE is working with K through 12 in terms of uh, using K through 12 as an early predictor of what's happening with the demographics, uh, but also in terms of collaboration where our local schools in the K through 12 level are also experiencing similar yes. kinds of constraints and challenges in terms of whether they consolidate, whether they close, yeah. and what happens with our regional school systems. Yeah. We have uh, created uh, in the Commonwealth over the last two years, uh, 18 early college high schools. Uh, our early college high schools require a partnership. It's not limited to public institutions. It is a school district, a community college, and a state university, some combination. Um, these programs are targeted uh, to students, particularly low-income students, uh, students of color as well. Uh, and we are hopeful that the outcomes will show that those students are not only gaining credit while they're in high school, college credit while that they are in high school, but they will continue on to the institutions that are identified. So um, I know both the Greenfield and Holyoke have been very much uh, engaged in this, and we think it's important that that pipeline be open. Uh, there are uh, areas where we're working with our institutions. We need to uh, facilitate transfer uh, so those students uh, can take those credits wherever they are earned and apply them to, at this point, any of our public institutions. The private institutions can accept them as well. We need to deal with remediation. Uh, we have uh, a number of pilots uh, across the system. Uh, we need to deal with the changing demo demography of our students as well. In Massachusetts, we are not only seeing a sea change in terms of enrollment, we are seeing, seeing a sea change in terms of demography. At this point in Massachusetts, our Latinx population uh, consists of about 8% of our high school graduating uh, class. By that period of time, 2020, uh, 2035, 2030, it's going to be a quarter. So we are getting a sea change in terms of demography. Uh, the white student population uh, in, our, in our high schools right now is 81%. By that period of time, that 2035 period, it's going to be 56%. So uh, we need to adapt to that change and adapt to it quickly. Uh, we need to ensure, and, and this is, I'll say this with the legislators here, Massachusetts, in terms of attainment, in terms of the percentage of the population that has a post-secondary degree is number one in the country. We're close to 60%. That's why they call us the most educated state. But if you scratch the surface and you look at the, gra the gaps, the opportunity gra gaps across our state in terms of students of color, uh, and students by ethnicity, it is among the worst in the nation. We are leaving students behind. When we need more institutions, more students to populate these institutions that are having difficulties. So we need to focus our efforts on making sure more high school students are successfully going through high school, getting a college experience before they get to college, and moving on. And that, I think, if we don't do that, we're not only, uh, and I, I written a paper recently that says this is not only an economic imperative for the Commonwealth, it's a social imperative. We have got to look a little differently on how we take those students from high school and move them into college. Because you're right, uh, the, the percentage of, uh, of, of students that are that is declining at the high, high school level, the numbers of graduating uh, uh, high school students, is not distributed uniformly across the state. It impacts particularly the western and the southeastern part of the state. We see the numbers. We know the high schools that are in jeopardy of, of closing. That's not a good sign. So we have to find ways to get more students going through our system. I'm a little passionate about that. <laughs>
I think you're speaking to the right crowd uh, with the message of equity. President Royal. Um, and while the president is coming up, I just want to make sure that we're all tuned in to the fact that uh, in the legislature, there is something called the Promise Act. The Promise Act was filed in the Senate uh, by Senator Sonia Chang Diaz, in the House by Representative Aaron Vega, our own from Holyoke, and Representative Mary Keefe. It begins to, doesn't, you know, we want it to go even further, but it begins to both reinvest money that the legislature hasn't been investing in our public institutions, um, which is the pipeline feeder, as you said rightly, uh, Leo, to our colleges, uh, and it begins to ch actually change the formula, so the foundation formula, and begins to really look at it along the lines of equity, as you're saying, Mr. Commissioner, um, really doing uh, a big deep dive into leveling the playing fields around low-income districts, so funding 10th, 9th, 8th decile districts, also thinking about uh, SPED, special education, English language learners. So there is, there is a lot underway in our K through 12, and I am sure we all would agree, I'm gonna make a big assumption here, that, and I'm sure Mr. Commissioner, you agree that we actually have to do better by early ed as well, right? Our early ed providers are not paid a living wage. We need to ensure universal uh, early education and the like so that we get this kind of robust feeder. President Royal. Forgive me for going on. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for your remarks and everybody else who've offered commentary. Uh, there was something that you, you just said that um, sparked a thought I, I wanted to share with everybody. Um, I've been in uh, Western Massachusetts for two and a half years as president of Holyoke Community College, um, and I find our region to be an incredibly collaborative part of the state. Um, you know, a part of it is the, the, uh, the dynam dynamics of our region, um, part of it, you know, is the size and, and other things, but, um, but it is incredibly collaborative. Um, I think we need to be thinking about that through the lens of this particular issue. You know, Mount Ida broke open this issue in a very public way, um, even though it's not the only closure, um, but uh, Hampshire really brought it home for us. Um, this idea of that this issue of what's happening in higher education is a local issue. It's not a national issue. It's not happening in another state. It, well, it is happening, but it's not just happening somewhere else. It's now happening in our backyard. And so um, my comment is for us to think about this as a Western Massachusetts issue because the connectedness of higher education, K-12, to community colleges, community colleges, to four-year, public and private, there is an economic ripple effect. Um, when any one of us suffer, we all will feel this in our region. And uh, I even think, uh, you know, sitting here thinking about how Holyoke uh, K-12 system is in receivership. You know, that doesn't just affect Holyoke Community College, uh, it affects all the potential students that we have transferring to four years, um, and again, it, it, it affects the population that we have working after they graduate. So um, I think one of the opportunities I want to offer up is that while there's conversations happening in respective cities and towns here, we need to have more of the regional discourse around this topic and how we can ensure that we have a healthy economy for higher education in Western Massachusetts and what we can do to operate differently in thinking about that. Um, economies come and go, and um, as we've already heard about, um, higher education is a very important economy to Western Massachusetts. So what can we do to facilitate this cross-community conversation um, in a way that is not just about um, Hampshire College, but what can we do proactively to really start thinking about the changing relationship between higher education and workforce and the communities that we serve? Um, because there's so much, there are so many other factors that are changing that um, we could have a tremendous amount of discourse on, and we should be. And um, you know, and, and I and I think uh, both our senator and and representative, um, you know, that there's some opportunities for some regional dialogue like this, and I appreciate you bringing this um, conversation to Amherst and let's continue to have this not just in reaction to a problem that we want to fix but um, proactively so that we can create vibrant um, future for Ma Western Massachusetts. Thank you President Royal. 
Thank you so much. Other questions or comments for the commissioner? Please. Hi, my name is Stacy, and I'm a nearby resident. And I think what I want is to reflect a theme that I've been hearing and ask you to address it a little bit more specifically and perhaps ask the legislators to as well. And what that is is I feel like your regulations are very on top of making sure that in the event of a college closing, the students are taken care of. And what I hear a lot of people saying is, who's making sure that in the event of a college closing, the community needs are taken care of? And I've heard that from so many people here. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the last person who brought it up, the town manager, you said, okay, let me be clear about what's in my authority and what's not. And I'm, I guess my question is, if that's not in your authority, is there somebody who's tasked with helping make sure that we lower the risk of colleges closing for the good of the community as a whole, and that we manage the impact of colleges closing for the community as a whole. I care a lot about the students. I also want to hear you address, or, or the legislators perhaps, address the needs of the community as a whole when there's a, this huge industry with several big players that could close. Yeah, I think the, uh, the, the, the key uh, message in terms of what our authority is, if we can intervene earlier uh, if we can um, really have the conversations with the institutions earlier, I think it helps uh, along um, the, the entire spectrum of, of those that are impacted, the communities, uh, the students, the institution itself. Um, so that would be my, um, sort of my call to the institutions, is get us involved and engaged earlier. Let's not have surprises. Uh, let's, let's basically do things in a planful way, and planful way to, that might lead to a closure, but also a planful way that can lead to a revitalization of the institutions. Uh, it is the responsibility of state government to deal with uh, the, the impacts of these closures in different ways. It's not just the Department of Higher Education, it's Health and Human Services, it's, it's economic development, there are a variety of areas. Uh, and, and I think we have to, um, and since this is clearly now on our radar screen in a big way, uh, we do have to bring together the various uh, uh, parts of state government, just as we've done around the, the example I gave you of homelessness among students. We can't alone uh, address that issue, but in combination with other state agencies and nonprofits. I mean, we haven't talked about the role that nonprofits can play in this, uh, in this uh, particular area. So. Um, I, I think there's there are more that can be done. Uh, I think that our role is is really in ensuring that uh, the conversations start early enough for us to intercede. In Mount Ida, we had no possibility of interceding uh, early on. There were you know there were conversations about mergers that took us by surprise. There were conversations about real estate that took us by surprise. And had we been partners earlier in that process, uh, I'm not saying it would have stopped the, the closure, but it could have. That's, that's, that's a, a stretch, but I feel hopeful. Uh, and particularly, there are other institutions that we've had conversations with early on that I think uh, improved the situation and has improved, and we're ongoing having ongoing conversations as, as, as we speak uh, with, with institutions. I think our engagement and involvement earlier um, is a positive uh, element to this process. Uh, and at one point, when we started these conversations, the view was you get the Department of Higher Education involved. That's a clear uh, sense that it's not going to pull out. And I think we have to, we have to realize that we're all in this uh, together and that by our engagement and involvement is not to precipitate uh, a closure, uh, but it's, uh, it's rather to get in front of it early enough that, that something that is some intervention uh, might, might work. So that's how I would respond to your, to your question, um, which is an important one. Thank you. And then, you know, from the state legislative perspective, clearly our concern for community and the well-being of community and seeing this as really an interconnected issue. 
right, campus, of student, faculty, all of the jobs, as Paul was saying, I think so well, the impact on the region, the economic impact on the region drove us, uh, I'll speak for you, Rep. Dom, drove us to be quick advocates and reach out to the commissioner quickly and have this conversation and then stay engaged, as President Royal is asking us to do, to continue to be part, a, hopefully a positive part of what is a continued conversation and collaboration and networking and figuring out uh, the best way that we can leverage our work um, with regard to the Department of Higher Ed, but then more specifically, as the commissioner rightly says, um, higher ed and the well-being of higher ed connects across sectors. So another question, please. Um, you and your staff have uh, clearly tremendously good intentions and you really want to help and I think that's great. Um, however, uh, despite your good intentions, you told us at the beginning that you and your staff have not developed a valid metric for deciding uh, which institutions are about to fail or might, you know, Just more likely to fail and so forth. Clarification, we have multiple metrics. We don't have one metric. That have, works. Well, various metrics work in different ways. You have to look at, at a combination of metrics to come up with a, with a sense of, uh, of the reality that you're facing. So there is no one metric. People think that we're only looking at one, whether it's the teach out viability metric and using that exclusively. No, you have to look at a wide variety of factors. Well, so um, let, me, let me go ahead with what yeah. I was gonna say. Um, so uh, Mr. Uh, Bachman, I think your name is, is that right? Yes, um, said that uh, the problem is the problem essentially is if you shout fire in a crowded theater, people are going to stampede. And uh, I taught at Hampshire College until the end of January, and I was there in the first intense two weeks of this whole event. And it's clear at, from what happened then and what happened later that um, you know a lot of students were spooked by the idea. Oh my gosh, you know Hampshire is in danger of closing, and so. Um, there is this real possibility, which I, I don't hear you really responding to, mm -hmm. that by identifying institutions that are at risk of closure, mm -hmm. that you're going to spook the students and their parents, and you're going to cause their possible closure. Yeah. And good intentions don't change that, you know? I mean, I don't, I'm not sure you realize the intensity and the suddenness and and the totality of that effect. So, um, and I'm alarmed that in this document that I picked up at the desk, uh, which I guess is a bill, is that what that is? I'm sorry, CMR regulations, regulations. okay. That um, it's very vague about how that process will be uh, carried out and uh, your office has a tremendous amount of power over it, but there seems to be no process of debate over whether those metrics really work. In other words, there's no involvement, for example, as far as I can tell, of uh, economics departments or education schools or whatever in the university system to help evaluate whether that's uh, the issue. So um, I, I'm, I, I'm still concerned about the death list <laughs> issue, and, uh, and I'm concerned about how there will be public comment on this if, if the regulations are passed and then all the authority resides with your uh, department and there's no further sort of public comment and feedback going on. Just a point of clarification. Uh, we did rely on uh, experts. We received a report from um, a commission of CFOs from uh, our um, uh, nonprofit independent institutions. They provided a whole uh, methodology uh, that we have uh, looked at carefully and found to be of value as well. Uh, we have had experts at Parthenon provide a, uh, an alternative methodology that uh, has actually some uh, important characteristics. We're using multiple measures. Uh, if we were to simply take the uh, 
the metrics that uh, the many metrics and say we're going to use these four metrics and put it out there you would find a death list and we are not going to put out a death list uh, and the information some of it is public most of it is public but in fact it is the private information that comes from the institutions it's really going to give us a sense whether an institution is going to be able to get through these difficult times or not it's not simply a metric, and again, I go back to the notion that it's an art uh, as opposed to a science. Uh, and that's how our conversations have gone with the institutions we've started a discussion. We've been in conversations with Hampshire College, and, and in fact, we found out from them about their financial difficulties. We didn't have any list that had Hampshire College on a list, and therefore we uh, approached them and had these conversations. They informed us. So I, I, I don't you know, uh, this, this notion that somehow we have all this, uh, have these techniques that are going to be able to predict with uh, uh, some degree of specificity is uh, it's not true. And, and the, the, correct, the, the, the fact is we're going to use multiple measures and the timing of, the, of any announcement that we recommend to an institution do for, it, for its students is going to be crucial. I agree with you. If you do it too early, it's going to create problems. Uh, Hampshire College notified its students. Its students were aware that they had financial difficulties when they, when they went public. And it is still uh, in, uh, uh, in the process of, of dealing with its, its financial reality. So uh, we are certainly cognizant of the, the possibilities uh, that, uh, that things might not be perfect. Uh, but we think that allowing for the flexibility that the regs provide is better than coming up with a straight jacket to apply to all institutions in one particular way. Thank you so much. Just also to your point, this is the moment where we need input on these proposed regulations. So your voice is now part of the public record, right? And everybody else who gets to speak on these topics and these regulations will help help inform what the commissioner and the department do. So, I mean, I think this is really, this is important. They put them out for public comment. May I respond to that? Well, My point is that the metrics haven't changed. We can't respond to what the metrics are because we have not been told what the metrics are. And so, but by the time the metrics are developed, our chance for comment will have passed. If I, if I may, I think then your comment would be, we would want to see a description of the metrics. I mean, that's, an, that's a legitimate comment to make on regulations. It's hard to make a comment because I haven't seen the specifics on the metrics. I would like them to be public. If I can say just one thing, I really want to make sure people hear this because we're coming to the close. The comment period on these regulations is being accepted until August 9th. Senator Comerford and I will be posting this information on our Facebook page and social media, so you'll have the email address you can send it to, the date you have to send it by. We'll post the link again for where you can find the regulations. You can send it directly to the, the Bureau, um, sorry, the Board of Higher Ed. You can send it to us, we can forward it, whichever is easiest for folks. But comments can be, um, in addition to some of the things that the commissioner has said, hey, we can't do that, we're the Department of Higher Ed, meaning some of the economic impacts. A comment can also be, we want the Board of Higher Ed to work more closely with some of the other departments in the administration around the community impact. I'm not sure they'll do it, but you can put it in a comment. Right. Putting it in a comment's important. It's part of the public record. I know that's, this is something that Senator Comerford and I are gonna take back and say, okay, they can do this piece. Where, who's doing all the other pieces? Um, and your public comments on the regulations can drive that train as well. So I wouldn't necessarily leave here saying, I don't know what to say because I don't know this information or that. That can be the basis of your public comment. I need more information on this and that. If, um, I, if I can just make one final point. There is one entity we've not talked a lot about is an accreditor. The accreditor, NECHI, is responsible for ensuring not only the quality, but the financial stability of our institutions. NECHI has a lot of metrics that a lot of people don't know what they are. They manage to use them to actually uh, sanction an institution. They've come up with a, a new term. Uh, what is it called? They, uh, when they, the, uh, they notify. 
NetSheet now, the accreditor now has a new term, new part of their regulations where they notify publicly whether an institution is in trouble. So what we want to do is to make sure that we're working with the accreditor, that we come to an agreement on what institutions might be in difficulty, and that we start conversations with those institutions. Thank you. Commissioner, we have two more people that want to ask questions. Sure. Are you able to stay for about five more minutes past three o'clock? If I can get on the road around three, that'll be, uh, that'll be fine. We know that feeling yes. in Western Massachusetts. So, Steve, and then, and then Council Member. Hi, I'm Steve Brewer. I'm a faculty member at UMass Amherst, mm -hmm. and I also wanted to thank the department because the Department of Higher Ed is funding the Bridges program that I'm teaching in this summer, which is taking students from community colleges that are transitioning to the university and providing them with a summer opportunity to be on the university firsthand, to see what it's like, learn about it, and then to transition to begin as students in the fall. Um, but uh, I'm reminded in the conversation today of the parable that I'm sure most of you have heard that, uh, you know, you see babies floating down the river. We've seen 18 babies floating down the river. And so we're trying to figure out, you know, how can we rescue these babies? How can we pull them out of the water with nets and resuscitate them and do all the things to see if the babies are going to die or not? Um, and, uh, and of course, the question we really ought to be asking is, why don't we go up river and see what's throwing the babies into the water? I mean, that's, that's the real problem, that we're looking here at these trying to rescue institutions rather than thinking about what's causing the institutions to become unstable in the first place. And saying demographics, of course, is, is one part of it, but there are a lot of other pieces that, that fit into that as well. The fact that we've systematically disinvested from uh, higher education and, uh, and that inequality is causing people to postpone or... Um, not engage in child rearing at all. Um, you know, there are a whole bunch of factors that, that are resulting in the decline of higher ed. Um, and we recognize that your part is to sit there with the net and pull babies out of the water, and that's what these regulations are about. But I think all of us need to think about the political advocacy we need to engage in. And of course, we have the right people here that are fighting that fight on the front lines, but to try and save higher education altogether. I'll go over here. Hi, uh, my name's Andrew Steinberg, and I'm a member of the council here in town, been involved in municipal government for a number of years. And that's the perspective that I started thinking about. And I wasn't intending to speak until there was just some very good comments towards the end about question of metrics. Metrics are important, but metrics only work if you have the information that comes in that you then apply to the metrics in order to uh, make them functional. And it makes me think about the Department of Revenue and how they work with cities and towns and the requirement that information be provided to DOR so the DOR can look at the health of our local communities and make sure that we are um, adhering to sound practices and are, in fact, um, taking charge of our public finances in a way and being responsible. And what I was sort of feeling all the way through is that I was not confident that there was as much uh, attention being paid, but you can co uh, comment on this, it's really a question more than anything, mm -hmm. is as much uh, attention being paid to making sure that the information is coming in that allows the metrics to be applied as to the definition of the metrics. Yeah. Um, the, some of the information is publicly available, uh, uh, but some of it uh, is not necessarily timely. Uh, in other words, we may be a year behind, uh, so it, it, the institution may have changed during that period of time. So what we, we use publicly available data uh, we try to get it as recent as possible, um, uh, but that is just going to give you a snapshot of a, of a potential uh, difficult um, reality that an institution may be facing. You really need to sit down and have a discussion and know uh, how is their fundraising going. Uh, you need to know what their admissions plan is over time. Uh, you need to know what they have in terms of assets and their ability to withstand a difficult situation. 
That information can only be gleaned from the institution. It's very difficult to, uh, uh, to get public sources that can provide that kind of d detail. So um, it, the conversation with the institutions is fundamentally important. Uh, and that's where the, the request for additional information uh, to augment what you have from other sources, public or otherwise, uh, is, is part of the process. Uh, and uh, uh, we have successfully navigated that for six years. Um, uh, we had one very bad, uh, unsuccessful outcome, and we need to ensure that as we go forward that we don't have that again. Uh, and, and, and I think that that unsuccessful uh, closure of Mount Ida was a lesson for us. Uh, and we need, again, uh, we need to be more proactive than we were before. Right now, we're, we're pretty much, the regs are, show us to be reactive to, to what information we might get. And we have to be a little more proactive without endangering the, the solvency of an institution as we go forward. Thank you. And can we please... I think it's really, I have to say, I, I'm, it's extraordinary that um, a public official uh, like Commissioner Santiago came here on a Friday afternoon <laughs> to have this conversation. Equally as extraordinary that all of us are sitting here um, to be the reciprocal part of that. But really, thank you so much for being open to hearing this, for putting it on the record. Thank you for everybody for coming. I encourage you to submit your comments. It's been taken down by... DHE folks, but if you have more or you thought of something else, look for the information on how to provide that comment on both Senator Comerford's and my Facebook page. You don't have to have a Facebook page to find it. You can just do facebook.com and go to either one of us. We'll also, I guess, put it on Twitter and all sorts of other social media. She has a website. I don't, so you may want to look at there. Um, but we're more than... Um, happy to take your comments also for you to email them to us and for us to deliver them to the department and we are going to continue i can promise i can commit i think for both of us to look at so here's the problem here are the pieces that are available to solve the problem we're part of that puzzle but what are the other pieces in the administration that have to be brought into the conversation um, for, in order for that cross intersectionality to happen at that level too um, and I'm looking forward to having that because I think that we will all be able to participate in that. But I really can't thank you enough for coming and enjoying our community on a July afternoon. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.